Today, I am really, really happy to, um, to welcome Mary Louise Pratt. This is a great honor for me uh, to have her here to talk about her new book. Um, Mary Louise Pratt is Silver Professor Emerita of Spanish and Portuguese and Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University and Olive H. Palmer Professor in the Humanities Emerita at Stanford University. Her first book, Toward a Speech Act, Theory of Literary Discourse, made an important contribution to critical theory by demonstrating that the foundation of written literary narrative can be seen in the structure of oral narrative. Her highly influential book, Imperial Eyes, Travel Writing and Transculturation, has been reprinted many times and translated into multiple languages. She is co-editor of the book Critical Passions, Collected Essays of Jean Franco, as well as the recently published book Trumpism, Mexican America, and the Struggle for Latinx Citizenship. Today, uh, we will be talking about her wonderful new book, Planetary Longings, which was recently published by Duke University Press. Um, I shared a discount code with all of you if you'd like to order the book from the press, which does ship internationally. So welcome, Mary. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, to begin with, I just to start out, could you talk about the top three or four things that you'd li like young scholars to learn from this book or scholars of any age to learn from this book, be this in terms of its major stakes, methodology or conceptual interventions? Yeah, thank you. First of all, I'm very happy to be with you today. I enjoyed yesterday's uh, discussion a lot. It really helped me to cue in a little bit. And uh, this is one of the first uh, opportunities I've had to present the book because it came out at the sort of the end of the semester. So I look forward to all your comments um, on the parts that you were able to read for today. Every chapter in this book is really intended um, to kind of provoke dialogue or contribute to ongoing dialogue, to enrich dialogues that are already ongoing. Um, none, of, none of this book attempts to be the last word on anything. It's rather not trying, I'm not committed to getting it right exactly. I'm, it has much more of a um, catalytic kind of intention. Um, I think uh, one of the things that um, I highlight in the book is the fact the book is written um, in the book, I, I'm, it's written from a position of thinking from the Americas. It's not just thinking about the Americas, it's thinking about the world from the Americas. And I think that's kind of a, so that's the, the, the spirit that is informing the chat, the analysis there of, of moder modernity, neoliberalism, post-colonialism. I'm trying to take these big planetary constructs or projects and look and, and get a grasp of what they look like from the Americas. And um, so that's kind of one of the perspectival moves in the, in the book. Um, there's a kind of historical project going on in the book too, which is a very recent history. It's looking at the, what, the, what I call the millennial pivot, the, the pivot from the 1990s, the end of one millennium into the 2000s, the, the beginning of the other. And what kind of shifted then how you see the 1990s anticipating uh, and then what changes. So the change, for example, from the global to the planetary, um, to the, from the global to the geo. So we now have, and from, the, and from the post to the geo. So the 90s were the heyday of the, the post, the post-humanist, the post-colonial, the post-Marxist, uh, the post-everything. And in the 90s, the, 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 we get geo-humanities and, and geolinguistics and the geo kind of has, has come into play. And so that shift from the post to the geo and the planetary, the global to the planetary is another thing that I'm trying to look at there. And in particular, looking at the way, what I'm calling the crisis of futurity, which is one of the axes of the book, it sort of gets anticipated in the 90s, even by the post, because the post is kind of the prefix that puts your back up against the future. Um, and uh, so the, it gets anticipated in the 90s, but then it's really more in the 2000s that planetary planetarity comes into play and the need to grasp the crisis of futurity and address it is, is becomes much more urgent and, and central. Um, uh, probably the third thing that's important to me in the book is the use, um, the theory I use in the book of, of the concept. I rely a lot on Elizabeth Gross um, in um, 
her, her, recon her conceptualization of concepts as constructions that are not true or false, but are rather enabling. And they enable the, they enable the possibility of thinking otherwise, of imagining being otherwise. So they are in that sense, futurology, future, futuristic in her conception of them. And I try to use her, explore concepts from that point of view. What possibilities, what possible futures do they enable? How do they, and the other uh, piece of her analysis is that concepts are always connected to problems. And you can't grasp a concept without grasping the problem to which it is, which has given rise to that. And they don't solve the problems, they enable the characterization of them. So that, uh, that work on the concept, I think, has been very helpful for me and one of the things I hope people will be able to take away. And of course, the other thing is uh, the centrality of imagination. Uh, the fact that people operate in the world the way they imagine the world to be. And um, the, 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 then the importance of educating imaginations, of um, what, of, of, the construct the process of constructing imaginations is something that we have not had really very powerful ways of thinking about and um I, the, the force of the imaginary in in every single thing we think or do is i think something that we still have to come to grips with um when i as in my before my teaching career ended i used to um say to students, to, my, to doctoral students, say you always have to be able to answer the question, what is at stake in what you're doing? I always would say, you have to never lose sight of the big picture and never let your readers lose sight of the big picture, no matter how micro an analysis that you're doing. And I think um, that's a piece of, of advice that I would like to pass on. And um, in terms of, Method, you know, uh, I don't have a method and anybody who reads my work knows that. <laughs> but I think of method, I think of method a lot through metaphors that there are very different ways of approaching things methodologically, depending on what it is you're, you're studying. You know, so there's a method where that I use, for example, when I started tracking the killer bees and stolen kidneys and chupacabra stories in the 80s and 90s, that would, you know, you're, that's a kind of method where you're sort of tracking something and you, you expect it to recur and you're tracking, watching for it and collecting it as a, the examples as you go along and watching it unfold. Um, and, then, and then there's a method of juxtapositioning, which is often called comparative, but I think of it as juxtaposing unlike things, allowing them to illuminate each other. So what does the apple let you see about the orange that you didn't see or or, and what does the orange let you see about the apple? So that juxtaposition um, is another kind of method. And um, another one is, is uh, if you have a corpus, if you're working with a corpus, there's the one where there's a method that, in, in the way Gabriel was talking about this yesterday, the method where you unearth something that's hidden and you bring it to light, right? And um, that's another, so, Travel writing was something that was not an object of academic study. And as soon as you bring it to light and start making it into one, all kinds of things happen. But there's another, there's another method that, that I call the sitting in the dark method where you have, you have your, and this is the method, for example, in the chapter in the book on the novel of the 1990s. I just said, let me read all the Latin American novels written in the 90s that I can find, I was living in Mexico. And then let me just see what I see. And then that, but my figure for that method is not you shining the light on something, it's you sitting in the dark, waiting for your vision to adjust so you can start to see things. And that figure of knowing is one I really like a lot. Um, I think it, uh, yeah, it somehow is very interesting to me to, come to do to think of knowing in that way so that's a that's about that's enough <laughs> oh thank you okay um so i have a question i wanted to 
talk about in the book's introduction, you write about force as a key concept and the one that indexes the unpredictable dynamism of our contemporary moment, where things that used to look like more bounded systems or structures can operate or at any range or scale and have the ability to make things happen in any context in which they come into play. Could you talk about uh, why you find it useful to think about indigeneity as a force and a relation rather than an identity? And by the same token, um, I'd also like to hear about why you find it useful for thinking about coloniality, which refers to, I, I believe, in your work as renewals and mutations of colonial world, world making after formal decolonization, why you think about this as a force rather than as a structure. Sure. Yeah. Just in general, um, I see the concept of force as something, as you said, that enable us to think and analyze across all ranges and scales and to tack really fluidly between the micro and the macro. So fire can be a lit match or a devastation of an entire country, right? And um, so it enables you to cross scales and, and more fluidly. And I think that's a kind of thing that we need a lot in these days when we're trying to think about planetarily. It also, the idea of force also enables you to think across a full range of, of, of beings. Um, you can think force in terms of coloniality, but you can think about the force of virus and what the virus is able to make happen in the world or what fire is able to make happen in the world. So you can think about force without necessarily attaching it to intentionality or agency or teleology. And I think that kind of makes it helpful, not, not not as something to replace the, uh, the idea of structure or system, but rather it's something that really has forms of explanatory power that those don't have. Um, it also, the idea of force to me, when I think about coloniality as a force or indigeneity as a force, I think it, it, the idea of force can handle um, unpredictability, uh, improvisation, spontaneity, things that just happen, the unpredictable. Um, because forces make things happen without intentionality and, and, and uh, predict, prediction. And um, so we've been taught to evaluate theories in terms of their predictive power. And I think right now we have to cultivate the domain of unpredictability and learn to theorize that, think about it and know about it because in the Anthropocenic era, we are in the era of, of unpredictability. Um, so, um, that those are things I think thinking in the context of ecological devastation, those are things we need to, to be able to think about. Um, in terms of indigeneity in particular, uh, the way I have thought uh, indigeneity is that as not as an identity, is that if you are an indigenous person, your identity is your the community or tribe or pe uh, people collectivity that you belong to, whose history or whose history goes back to before there was indigeneity. In other words, before the colonial encounter. So indigeneity, not indigenous identity, but indigeneity is a product of the colonial encounter. As I always say. For, for someone to be indigenous, someone else has to show up. And um, so I think of uh, indigenous, of ident identity as being rooted in your community, your collectivity, your tribe, your people. And then indigeneity is, um, is a force that um, it, it is all, it's not that it, it cannot be thought of as a category. It can be, it is operates as a category all the time. But it's, um, I don't think of it as uh, an identity um, in, in, in its originality. Um, indigeneity presupposes the identity um, that you had. And with coloniality, I think the, the neat thing about force is it enables you to um, grasp how the force outlives the structure. So you can have, um, you know, colonial, um, colonial uh, st political structures be dissolved or replaced, but the force of coloniality continues and, and, and continues to have generative powers and continues to mutate. That's why I like the word 
coloniality quite a lot. I think it, it's very helpful in um, grasping the long endless afterlives of empire and colonialism. So. That's very helpful. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next one is a kind of a two part question. So I um, wanted you to talk about um, how coloniality has affected the scholarly study of Latin American history and culture, or certain aspects of it. Um, and also, it seems to me that a central aspect of your work is to offer alternatives to these kind of tendencies. So could you also highlight some of the ways that your book does this working in, against the kind of coloniality um, involved in uh, scholarly study of um, Latin American history and culture? Well, this question really made me think. And I realized that when I uh, decided I wanted to do a PhD specializing in Latin American literature in 1971, there were only, I know it's ancient history, there were only four departments in the United States where you could do that, uh, study Latin America as your major field. In departments of Spanish, the central were, were anchored in the Spanish golden age, the way English departments were anchored in Shakespeare. And you had the, you, if you were doing a doctorate, you had just, your, your major field would be norm, just naturally in Spanish literature. And um, so that was the colonial in, imperial configuration of the study of Latin America and of, of the, the Hispanic world in, in the 70s. But that was also changing. And I, it was changing partly because of revolutionary movements in Latin America and revolutionary art in Latin America. When I, I in my last year at the University of Toronto, uh, I had a professor of Latin American literature who gave a course on revolutionary literature of Latin America. And he was a Jamaican Marxist who was a, a supporter of the Cuban revolution. And um, he introduced us to Guillen and Neruda. He had all this wonderful material to work with. And that was a, to me like it was a sign of the changing of the field. And in fact, when I came to Stanford to do that PhD, Stanford hired uh, Jean Franco, a, a, a Latin Americanist from, great, from the UK, to uh, come in and refound the department, um, and uh, it in, in Latin American studies became even more prominent. The other thing that shifted is something that we were, was getting talked about somewhat yesterday. Another thing that shifted the study of Latin America drastically in the United States was the advent of area studies after World War II when um, it was realized that Cold War geopolitics required universities to be no mobilized to pr produce knowledge about the parts of the world where there was a threat of communism, parts of the world that the, the global south, what we call now, that needed to be policed and known and dealt with. And so vast amounts of money poured into area studies in universities, and that's when you got Centers, centers set up for Latin American studies, Middle Eastern studies, African studies, these, this, these interdisciplinary knowledge production machines. And um, what was ironic is in the humanities in particular, those <laughs> enterprises created in incredibly uh, powerful, exciting spaces for anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist thought. And so um, all Latin American history, that Latin American literary, literary studies, these became places where the anti-imperial, anti-capitalist uh, thought and, and reflection and research was being done. So those, the area studies organizations like Latin American Studies Organ Association or Middle Eastern Studies developed these big radical wings um, that, uh, that we're, we're working on the, with a sense of the inevitability of the overthrow of capitalism. And unbeknownst to them or un, unintended, we were like an unintended consequence of area studies. But for example, it was in the humanities that a great deal of us, many, many of us got money to learn languages as I did. I learned Portuguese with a defense language summer institute summer grant that um, lots of people got in order to um, yeah, in order to, to provide language expertise. 
So, um, and in, for my generation, in that period of the 70s and 80s, it was very exciting to be studying Latin America, the, the intellectual work, those, that anti-imperialist agenda is kind of what claimed us, the way Gabriel described yesterday being claimed by uh, French theory, you know, that that kind of claimed us in the humanities, the Cuban revolution, then Chile, the um, arrival of Allende in 71, the revolution in Nicaragua, Granada, all these things, and then the dictatorships and the critique of the dictatorships and the incredible amount of creative knowledge and art that were produced in, in, the, in those dictatorships and about them, the, all the thought about how authoritarianism works. And there's a chapter in the book about that where I look at what was Chilean, the studies of Chilean authoritarianism and try and connect them to Trumpism. So it was a very interesting um, thing. And just anecdotally, uh, period, anecdotally, I remember, at the Latin American Studies Association meetings, they were just the most exciting places to be intellectually uh, because they were multidisciplinary. So, you know, a literary scholar could go to a session on agronomy if they were working on regional, you know, it was just astounding. But in Latin American Studies Association, the CIA was part of the, part of the association and it sent members there and they gave panels and they spoke on panels and they wore their bags saying, Fulana et tal CIA. And it was not hidden or any, in any way at all. They were part of the intellectual apparatus and were identified that way. And I remember in, uh, in 1980, in the Latin American Studies Association meeting was in Bloomington, Indiana. And the entire Sandinista leadership came to the meeting right after they had ousted Somoza and they, there was this incredible event where in an auditorium and there they were up on the stage and everybody was just wild with joy and cheering. And, and I remember the CIA guys sitting in front of me in the row in front of me and they were the only ones not standing up. <laughs> but after that, the CIA kind of, di kind of disappeared into the, into the mix um, in, the, uh, in Lhasa. But that's just a way, yeah, so. The, it was the framework of imperiality, I think, that animated a lot of Latin American studies, not, not as much coloni colonialism as, as imp imp empire, both Spanish empire and US empire was. Well, that's an amazing anecdote, but um, <laughs> uh, can you talk about why mobility and travel have been such fruit, uh, fruit, uh, provided such a fruitful lens for you to analyze the dynamics of imperialism, the constitution of Western subjectivities, and how material exigencies shape culture and ideology? And also how your approach to analyzing mobility, travel, and also staying in place has been influenced by processes of globalization, contemporary imperialism, and how people have responded to these processes. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, I, now I call this thinking through mobility. And I kind of, I kind of trigger that paradigm by saying, you know, whenever somebody moves, gets into motion, there's a story starting to happen. <laughs> Something is happening. And when large numbers of people are put into motion, there's a historical process of some kind going on. So the, the, um, the connection of travel with story is built into this idea of thinking through mobility. Um, I was born into, as most of you were probably too. I was born into the kind of bourgeois paradigm of travel as the way to become an educated person, a citizen of the world. I inhabited that paradigm and I loved it. I loved that paradigm. I was from a farm town in Ontario, 3000 people. And the idea of being able to see the world was again, as I say in the, the end of the intro, that was a life I, wa I could imagine wanting to live. Um, I have a, I'd like to just quote a little piece from the book um, that sums up this, uh, this paradigm. Um, what we got here? Yeah. The alignment of scholar with traveler is held in place, I think, 
by authority. In the modern Western imagination, mobility is the privileged figure for freedom and for knowing. The traveler is the figure par excellence of the self-possessed autonomous subject defined by, by a set of, whoops, let me just get this, I'm oh, sorry. Defined by a set of inalienable rights that attach to its body wherever it may be located. Mobility is the proof and performance of the subject's liberated rights possessing state, which transcends place. Mobility in turn is the figure for modern knowing. This sentient subject pursues knowledge of the world by moving through it from place to place, topos to topos, idea to idea, exploring, following leads, tracking things down. Discovery is tied to voyage. The freedom and authority of the scholar align with those of the traveler and the travel writer. As indigenous scholar Sandy Grande astutely points out, postmodern approaches, if anything, intensify this modernist paradigm by privileging um, the, my lights on by privileging a mobile, transgressive, ungrounded, hybrid subject as the new agent of critical knowledge. Emancipated from the trammels of bounded identities, this subject transcends boundedness and comprehends from a position one theorist described as resplendent placelessness. Sorry for this. This is the point at which Grande argues indigenous perspectives provide a, a means of interruption. From an indigenous point of view, to put it crudely, that untrammeled mobile traveler, nor is an, is, an, is an ominous and all too familiar figure. He arrives uninvited carrying a rifle. That's my image, not hers. In Grande's words, thinking from indigeneity, the sim seemingly liberatory constructs of fluidity, mobility, and transgression are perceived not, not only as the language of critical subjectivity, but also as part of the fundamental lexicon of Western imperialism. So that she, that's her way of interrupting that paradigm of the bourgeois paradigm of travel. For me, the interruption came, oddly enough, at when I was teaching, at, at Stanford, the international relations program was inviting faculty to create new courses for their students. And they wanted courses that were about relations between places, not comparisons. And so a colleague and I, Rina Ben Mayor, and I devised a course on travel writing and imperialism. And that's where my, the whole, suddenly the paradigm the travel paradigm became available to me for study as an object of study. And um, uh, then of course, once you got in the nineties with neoliberalism, once you started getting global migration in, on a mass scale and the recycling of these travel narratives to try to make sense of what was happening in the world in the nineties, that's when then the shift from me, for me happened from studying travel to studying mobility and the idea of thinking through mobility and the kind of dialectic relation between north to south travel and south to north travel. Um, so that's kind of how mobility became that. And then I began to think about the, the dialectic between going and staying that for everyone who goes, there are those who stay and that's a relation the, the leavers have a relation to the stayers. And how does that, what, what's the story that is going on in those situations, so. Thank you. Um, now, your work is broadly concerned with world making, which you define as the actions, practices, and creations by which people craft meaningful realities and stories for themselves out of their engagement with the world. And you analyze these processes in popular expressive culture, as well as in literary works and high, high cultural forms. And while this is a perfectly coherent approach, I don't think it's one that can be taken for granted, given how knowledge production is organized by bourgeois Western institutions. So I'd like to hear you talk about how you develop this approach to studying culture and what you understand its stakes to be. Um, and did you need to work against or retool certain methodological or philosophical presuppositions of Western literary studies and aesthetics? And could you also talk about how the analysis of such a broad array of, of expressive practices, many of which have not developed a reflection on their own discursive materiality, 
make certain demands on your methodology, analytical categories, or norms of evaluation? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think I have an answer for the last piece of that. Um, I, I don't know how to think about it, and I would like to hear what, what um, readers of the book say. You know, the, but the other part, the, the question of moving a month, but not of re, putting the literary in the same field as the non liter as everything else or other form expressive forms is, you know, that's, I mean, partly that's characterological. I have always been um, just a very anti hierarchical being. Uh, particularly around hierarchies of the high and the low. And I think that maybe, uh, who knows that, I could give a million explanations for that. Um, one of which is the coloniality of Canadian culture and the fact that, you know, when I was a child, every, every room had a picture of the queen looking down on us from above. <laughs> but um, one, one turning point in all this for me in terms of academic work was when theory first arrived, it, literary theory first arrived in the universities, it, the first kind of theory in literary studies was um, Russian formalism, one of the first. And I remember, so one of the first theory courses I remember ever being given at Stanford was a, a course by a guy in the Russian department, the Slavic department on Russian formalism. And the Russian formalist, and now, and I was very interested in that because I had done an MA in linguistics and I had thought I was gonna be a linguist and I ended up coming back to literature. The Russian formalists, the, their whole, Russian formalism as a theory of literature hinged on this opposition, an opposition between poetic and ordinary language. And the poetic language had these features and ordinary language lacked those features. And the, the whole edifice was built around that distinction and didn't work without it. And I thought it was complete bullshit. The, the creativity of everyday language was very obvious to me. And I had read people like the sociolinguist William LeBove who had done this really innovative work studying um, at Black English in, the, in, in Philadelphia and at its forms of creativity and expressiveness. And so there was a lot, a lot of that kind of knowledge out there. So I did, um, so I wrote my dissertation, a book called Toward a Speech Act Theory of Literary Discourse, which was intended to challenge that distinction between the poetic and the ordinary as a way of grounding the study of literature. And I drew there, I was able to draw on, on British ordinary language philosophy, um, as well as the sociolinguistic work of people like LeBove. And yeah, I took a lot of heat for that. Um, there were a, a lot of people really disliked that, um, that work. Um, other people really liked it. I mean, it, it, it had a kind of radical side that, that, was, that was exciting to people. But I think that was one. And then of course, you know, um, cultural studies methodologies came along and they were also, they were much more open to locating the literary within uh, larger areas of social, the social and of culture. And I was particularly affected by Jean Franco, the British a Latin American as cultural studies scholar who in turn had been a disciple of the British Marxist in particular Raymond Williams. And when she uh, at Stanford, she founded, um, she, she formed a collective that founded a magazine called Tabloid, a review of mass culture and everyday life. And we started reading, this collective started reading everything we could about mass culture, about everyday life, about um, expressive culture, popular culture, commercial culture, music. We studied Muzak and call in radio and, and um, the Grateful Dead and all kinds of things. And, um, and we were working with theory and every issue of the magazine had to have a theoretical theory essay that we produced as a collective. And we produced everything about that magazine. We did, we wrote it and then we had to, we pasted, we formatted it, we pasted it up. It was, this was just on the edge of when personal computers were coming in. And that certainly cemented my vision of, of culture and of my, my location of literature within a larger, a larger frame. Plus, you know, if you're studying Latin America, 
popular culture is so rich and vital and omnipresent everywhere in and in Latin American literature as well, you know. Um, and uh, so the vitality of popular culture and it's again like the figure of the gaucho as an example, but the the the, the formative power that popular presence of the presence of popular culture in Latin American literature. It's another place that you, another space where that all that all makes lots of sense. Thanks. Uh, thank you. So um, one of the things I really appreciated about your book is the way that it addresses um, anti-imperialist thought that emerged from third world liberation struggles, as well as some of the illusions of metropolitan post-colonial thinking that displaced it. And your book's final chapter addresses some of the signal contributions of anti-colonial thinkers in a way that I think really underscores their continued relevance to issues we face in the present. Um, so I have two lines of questions about this. Um, one, I wanted to ask you about some of the insights of anti-colonial thinkers that you find most illuminating or urgent and how you have developed these in your own work. Um, and the second one is I also wanted to ask how you account for the lack of attention to the tradition of anti-imperialist thought within Anglophone academic scholarship. Um, or to its outright rejection by some um, post-colonial uh, thinkers. Okay. Well, that essay began um, as an anti-post-colonial gesture. <laughs> I was right around just after the turn of the, uh, the turn of two thousand. Uh, I was invited to contribute to an an essay to a special issue of a journal called and it was that was going to be called the post-colonial past. And it was inviting uh, scholars to use post-colonial optics to reconsider moments in history, I guess. And I, at the time, was immersed in reading these anti-colonial thinkers because I had been trying to, I've been working on modernity and what, what does modernity look like if you, if you abandon the Euro-centered narrative of this thing that that you know surges up in Europe and spreads to the rest of the world in a diffusionist way. If you get if you aren't using that and you're out somewhere else in the world looking at modernity and the modern project of modernity, what do you see and how do you see it? So of course I was reading all these people, and so I wrote the essay as a as I say as a kind of um, uh, I guess an argument with that, um, saying we need to study the anti-colonial past, not the post-colonial past. And of course, the editors were very upset with me. Um, and uh, but I I wasn't going to withdraw the essay, and so it it appeared. And in the end, I think it created a pretty interesting dialogue um, around the the issue. And in the in the essay that you that we assigned for um, that chapter. Yeah, I tried to, I read those uh, when I, I, what I was reading for was what is, what are the points in common in this corpus of anti-colonial thought? What are the points in common? What are the, what are the tropes by which these writers formulate uh, colonialism and it's what it's action in their, in their spaces and on their societies. And I came up with those five tropes that I can talk about in the chapter, interruption, appropriation, um, obliteration, substitution, and reversal. And it's just a common point. That was just one of these examples where I'm looking at a corpus, looking for what, what is recurring here that I see. And um, they were producing a very compelling, incredible analysis <coughs> that, and it was an, an analysis that could be lived and acted upon um, it mapped alternative futures, and um, I was so I was very interested in that. I loved reading that material. And what happened to them? You know, I asked the same thing, and I. Um, it's really interesting. I would when I presented this material to audiences, to groups like study groups and stuff that I thought would be very open to it. Um, I got a lot, much more negative reactions than I thought it would. You know, this is all too black and white. And, um, and I think a lot of the, um, what happened to anti-colonial thought is what Gabriel was talking about yesterday. 
it was suppressed by anti-communism. You know, it treat it completely triggered anti-communist and anti-socialist responses. <clears throat> And it kind of kept getting expelled from departments. Um, and I remember in this in the seventies and eighties that in the eighties Stanford had um, had one uh, Marxist economist in the department, and they had two. They had two Marxist economists in the apart in, the, in their department, and they told one of them they were not going to give him tenure because they didn't want they weren't going to have more than one Marxist in the department. So he left. And the one Marxist they have in the department was uh, Kamala Harris's father, actually, Don Harris. Anyway, I think the other part way of saying this is that anti-colonialism did not offer an academic career path. In fact, it didn't offer much of any career path. They, people got killed, you know. I mean, <laughs> lots of, um, Cabral, you know, Rodney, all kinds of, got, got killed. And so part of what post-colonialism, the post-colonial did was I think displace the anti-colonial. And um, in, in the way that, that uh, we were discussing yesterday. Um, so I, I, and how, so yeah, that's about as far as I've gotten with, with thinking that thing through. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and somewhat related to this question, as well as to the critique of, of post-colonial thought that you um, develop in your book, is I'd, I'd be eager to hear you discuss how intersecting histories of colonialism, internal colonialism, neocolonialism, and imperialism have shaped culture in the Americas. And what modes of analysis are useful, you think, for attending to the specificity of these forces, as well as their interaction? Yeah, um, you know, I almost, um, my first impulse with that question is to flip it over and say, if you want to study empire and colonialism, where else would you try, where, where else would you look if not the Americas? Um, because Amer the, Amer the Americas fascinate me for many reasons, it's my home, but but they have a civilizational history that is precedes that is separate from the civilizational history of the Afro-Euro-Eurasian landmass. You know, just from the separation of continents means that that all kinds of that that the the cradle of civilization in the Americas did not start in Mesopotamia. You know. The, the Americas had their own um, Neolithic era, their own, they, in, the, the invention of the state, of, of the state form, of empire, of writing, of mathematics, astronomy, all these things did not come to the Americas from elsewhere. They, they came, they were developed independently in the Americas. So that's what I mean by saying the Americas have a civilization history and imperial history that's independent from the Afro-Eurasian landmass. And I think that fact often gets lost track of. Um, and the other, of course, fact about the Americas is that the colonial experience, the Euro-colonial experience goes way back. It goes, it starts in 1500, whereas post-colonialism seemed to always want to start with the scramble for Africa in the 1880s, you know? Um, and uh, so there, there's a much longer, um, history to be studied in the Americas and to be understood and much so much to be learned about that. Um, the other thing you get in the Americas that's a challenge and really, really interesting is the layering of empires. So the Spanish empire layered on top of the Inca empire and the Aztec empire and, you know, in the US Southwest then the US empire over layered on top of all of those. And so you have these layerings of empire in one empire kind of recycling the power forms of another and so on. And uh, that's some, again, for the study of sort of inter-imperiality, how empires interact um, may, is, a, is something that can, should thrive um, in the Americas. I could never understand why post-colonialism, it, it's consistent refusal to address the Americas, to study the Americas, to put them at the center of the field. 
there was some, there, there was, a, I've struggled so often. It's why, it's the main reason why I never have referred to myself as post-colonial critic or as doing post-colonial studies. Other people use that term. I never use it for myself. I just saw myself doing critical imperial, imperialism, critique of imperialism, but I could never understand. And I had this fight so many times with Edward Said saying, what is wrong with you? Like, and part of it was people didn't want to learn Spanish, I think, but there was something deeper there about not wanting the Americas to disturb this kind of seemingly unified thing that was going on between uh, Asia, Asia and um, Europe, so and Africa. So, yep. um, as you note in your book's introduction, we are witnessing calls to decolonize everything, which rightly responds to the persistence of colonial and neo-colonial forms of social relations in all kinds of areas of social life. So I'd love to hear you talk about how you conceptualize decolonization, its temporality or temporalities, the social agents it involves. And also I'd be like you to hear you talk about where and how you see decolonization happening in the Americas, whether you'd like to talk about that historically or in the present. You know, uh, I have, I have no idea how decolonization should work. I think there, there isn't a script for it, obviously. What we seem to know how to do is, is, is how to decolonize by showing the presence and force of coloniality and calling attention to it and explaining where we see it. But to remedy it, um, again, we do that in knowledge production um, in various ways by combating, for me, it was a struggle against Eurocentrism was just central to my identity as an academic and as a teacher. But the idea of a decolonized society is such a challenge because as Liz Gross would tell us, we, we can't, imagine it because we're, we're swimming in the waters of coloniality. So whatever we're able to imagine will almost certainly not be what it would be. <laughs> and so uh, we are, I think we are, we, we do the work of decolonizing knowledge, trying to decolonize imaginations. Um, I think our, our, the work of decolonizing institutions, for example, is not, I don't see that um, I don't see institutions yet being transformed by decolonizing efforts. I see them making adjustments like affirmative action and these kinds of things. But if you try to imagine what would, uh, what would a university, what ought it to look like if it were decolonized or what would a decolonized education um, look like? Um, I think we, um, so I have, um, yes, and we, what do we even like in terms of, do, do, do we, is, is the goal to extirpate racism and white supremacy? We thought it was, but now we are seeing that how, how unlikely it is that that will even be possible as opposed to just caging them up, you know? Um, so I think of decolonization sort of as a, I, I'm only able to imagine it as a kind of struggle and a striving for something, but uh, it's like the anti-patriarchal struggle. You, you can see the next, maybe a next move, but you don't have a big picture of the narrative that you're living. Um, and I had a really interesting experience uh, the last, uh, about three or four years ago, but just before the pandemic, I was in, in Cusco, again, my kind of touchstone place. And I gave a, a keynote address there at a conference on, two, on a literary figure, woman uh, writer from Cusco. And, um, uh, and it was called, um, oh, so it had decolonizing in the title. Anyway, after the conference, someone, 
a woman came up to me who was a professor at a un local university. She said, you have to come to my class tomorrow. I'm no, you can't say no, I'm coming to get you at two o'clock. So I go to her class and, and it's, there's about 30 students, mainly young, young men from Cusco, Mestizo people. And they wanted me, and their question was, okay, tell us how to decolonize. And I, I just sat there and I'm like, I can't tell you, you how to decolonize. And, but what struck me was we were sitting a bus ride, a long bus ride, but a bus ride from Bolivia where there was a ministry of decolonization and a revolutionary government and where all, there were new universities and all kinds of intellectual fervor was going on and political, all this stuff was going on. And these young men in Cusco had no connection to the neighboring struggle. Deco the idea of decolonization was supposed to run through me and coming from the metropole, or that was the invitation. And so what I said to them was, get on the internet and hook up with your peers the next country over and start that conversation. Um, so I'm not being very articulate about decolonization because I don't know. Um, and I'm even less, um, less happy. Well, I like the term decolonization. I think it names an urgent project and I, I, I use that term and I use it in much, in much greater preference to decolonial, which um, I have, that is a word that I know it's every, many, many people are finding it very useful and enabling. And I do not, I, I have never been able to figure out what it means. And partly it's a, in, it, it's a neologism in Spanish that it should be descolonial, not decolonial. And it's just something like, where is this word? What work is it doing? And where I've seen it, um, where I've seen it work productively is in, uh, in American, in the US at least, it has enabled, and maybe it functions this way elsewhere too, it is enabling people who did not previously think about coloniality to think about it. So American studies has kind of in the recent, since is, is regrounded itself in the story of settler colonialism. And that has produced an enormous outpouring of scholarship and, in, and great reframings of um, the discipline. And I think that's where that, the, de, the term decolonial enables that kind of a move to happen a coming to awareness um, to happen brings coloniality into view for people. But I, I don't, it's not connected to anything you could call a decolonizing practice um, <clears throat> necessarily. I had a really interesting experience uh, a few years ago at, uh, I was part of a, a there was a, a workshop on decolonization that was put on by a group of scholars from mainly based in Mexico, but it was it was combining indigenous and non-indigenous activists and and scholars, mostly some anthropo ethnographers, anthropologists. And the 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 the, the session was titled Indigeneity and Decolonization or something like that. And the organizers received a message from one of the scholars of decoloniality saying, <clears throat> we don't know why you wanna use the word decolonization in, with respect to indigeneity because it's a term that comes from outside. And decolonization was seen as a term connected to African decolonization. And it was seen as a, as a, um, you know, a, 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 an un, unjustified appropriation, whereas decolonial was the term founded here. So we should use that term. And the organizers said no, but it was just an interesting moment where the difference between the two terms became meaningful to, to some people. Um, so, yeah. Um, 
I wanted to ask you also um, about how feminism has influenced your thinking and your methodology. And I'd be particularly eager to hear you talk about um, how you approach vis -a feminism vis-a-vis -vis what you term the colonial divide. Yeah. Um, it's funny, feminism for me began in a, as a confrontation with Marxism. So in, in the areas I was working in, in, in this again, it's a long time ago, the, the story was still, um, we'll get to gender after the revolution. And so it was a lot of, there was a lot of work to be done to put feminism on the intellectual agenda in Latin American studies. And that was work that a group of us, we formed a collective uh, in the Bay Area and we worked for years to every year we put together a panel on um, feminism and, and, and it was in the literary arm, we were, we were reading all the uh, forgotten Latin American women writers and trying to push this field in this, this set of problematics and the problematic of gender onto the agenda. And it succeeded, but it took a long time. And there was a lot of, a lot of um, resistance from our own peers um, to accepting that. So it, 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 found, it started in that way. Um, and I think as far as uh, gender and coloniality happens, I mean, one thing, there would be a great deal to say about that, but one dimension I think is that uh, in the dramas of coloniality, women and men have different possibilities, different pathways, different tra trajectories, different forms of subordination and dispossession. Um, and, uh, you know, women and different, different agencies in the plots. So women become objects of exchange or, um, or um, they become domestic workers, they become concubines, they're able to traffic in their own, their own reproductive capacities. So there's just, um, there, the, there's a, the trajectories within the narratives of gender, or of coloniality, the trajectories are very gendered. And um, there's, and mobility is very, is very gendered. In one, the chapter in the book on going and staying on, um, I talk about a, a, a wonderful 19th century short story by a woman writer named Juana Manuela Gorriti that is just at the quintessence of gendered coloniality. It is about an indigenous woman who is, as a young girl, is raped uh, by a traveler passing by, a, Europe, a French traveler passing by. And uh, she has a, or no, it's a Spanish colonel, sorry. She has a baby and years later, she's with the baby by that spot in the road and a, a French traveler goes by and kidnaps the baby, takes it to Spain. Anyway, the, the story is about this woman who stays at this point in the road until she's able to confront the man who stole her daughter and, um, and he dies. But it's just a, a whole kind of geographically driven drama about gendered coloniality that I um, really enjoyed writing about in that chapter. <laughs> it's, a, I mean, it's a wonderful chapter. Um, I'm going to ask you two more questions and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A if that's all right. Um, one of them is about futurity as one of your book's key concepts. And in the introduction, you write that crises of futurity help us become aware that agency and being require a projection into a future that is by definition imaginary, even if apparently certain. So I'd like to hear you talk about what we can learn by attending to this dimension of consciousness, world making and representation, and also how it enriches our analyses of expressive culture and cultural traditions. Well, um, yes, the, 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 the futurity concept came into my vocabulary very much with those pamphlets from Alpha and Omega and the guy, the writer whose writer claimed to be a futurologist. <laughs> uh, and then of course my reading of, of Elizabeth Gross and her, and her linkage of concepts to futurity. I think futurity is a great concept to work with when, 
all the time when, when you're studying anything. You know, and when I went back to look at Latin American independence in the chapter on independences, I was suddenly reading these, these the architects of independence and their discourse is, is hinges on a, 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 a passionate articulation of futurity that is completely often hallucinatory, but it is completely invented. In other words, they're trying to create uh, support, gather people's agency to create something whose outlines are actually unknowable or virtually unknowable. And, and so the idea, every, the idea of looking at what is the futurity, the imagined futurity built into almost any narrative or any political project is just a very interesting angle, like lens through which to look at them. And I think futurity right now, we need we need desperately because as a concept and a, as, as a lens, because we're trying to grasp our own crisis of futurity in this sort of unprecedented planetary predicament that every, every being is facing. It's not just humans, not just us. Um, and we're living now with this, with this very much with a sense of, with the, you know, when you think, when parents now look at their children and their grandchildren, they feel like, we're moving from a sense of possibility to impossibility, of from plen plenitude to scarcity, from existence to extinction, from a known world to an unknowable world. And that, that crisis of futurity, we have to be able to explore it, to think it. Um, if we have alternatives to it, um, great, you know, uh, but there's this a tremendous amount of fear, anxiety, and grief. Um, and projecting into that future about how we're going to live, even if you're pessimistic, how are we going to live the next, the trajectory that takes us to the end of humanity, if that's what is, is the story. You have a lot of choices to make about how to live that. So um, that's sort of why I, the force I think of the importance that futurity has for me. And um, my final question is in a way related to this, which has to do with um, your particular approach you have for thinking about the Anthropocene. And I'd just like you to talk about why you wanted to make this contribution and how what you hope it enables for thinking through the, um, the crisis of futurity and the ecological crisis um, and our efforts to grapple with that. Yeah. Um, well, that, that piece on the Anthropocene was, again, it was a contribution to a larger conversation that a group of people were having um, that appears in, um, it came out in a book called Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, edited by Anand Singh and some other people. And so the Anthropocene piece was my attempt, again, to, to contribute to the conversation about Anthropocene. And um, I was bringing to it both the 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 literary concept of chronotope, um, which I thought was an, an, it, to enable, enable thinking of Anthropocene as in a more textured way as a time space configuration. And as concept to think about Anthrop Anthropocene as a projection into the future. And in particular, I wanted to make the point that the, that the parallel between Anthropocene and Holocene or other previous ages is very flawed because the Anthropocene is the thing that is, is, is not about a past that has a contours, it's about a future that is unknown. Uh, so it's very a very different um, time-space configuration. And uh, so I wanted to capture that. And if you've read the essay, you know that the way I do that. Um, and uh, I, I, so I wanna know what does, what does the term Anthropocene enable? And, I've ended up, I ended up thinking, I'm not sure it enables very much that's helpful. <laughs> um, and indeed, I think the term is, it seems to maybe be, be disappearing now or waning as if it has, you know, given what it had to give to us. It's, it's done the, what it, it's enabled, whatever it's going to be able to enable. And we'll pass on, I think we'll probably pass on to other, other concepts. Um, it's really interesting because uh, one interesting thing I'll mention is that uh, whereas Anthropocene is kind of 
one of those, it looks to me like it's one of those concepts that it appears and it does its work and it, it then it fades away. The way, do you remember when at the turn of the millennium, there was a whole outburst of literature on cosmopolitanism and suddenly that was the incredibly productive term and there was cosmopolitanism from below and there was alternative cosmopolitanisms that were all, and it was an, an alternative to post-colonial. And that lasted just for a few years. I got really interested. I collected all that stuff. I started reading it, and then, then suddenly it was kind of over and people moved on. Um, and one thing that's happened that, to me recently that's totally surprised me is that term uh, that I founded back in the 1990, the, the contact zone has had this incredible renaissance in the, in the last 10 years all over the place. And in all the, and I was, suddenly people are holding conferences um, about contact zones on like the board in Europe on the borders of Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, they, they have a contact zones conference. And um, there's a whole in someone in Korea in Seoul, not only did a conference on contact zones, they set up a contact zone institute. And I, I, get, I get inquiries from Patagonia. Uh, a whole bunch of teachers there wanted to translate the essay into Spanish and use the term to rethink their curriculum. And it just, kept, it just keeps popping up in the most unexpected places. And one of them was a group of geographers a few years ago who um, wanted to, to study human, non-human contact zones. And they held a whole series of sessions at the geography meetings that I was able to go to, which was really interesting. And how do you how do you use the term to create a space in which you talk about contact contact zones and how they operate and are made to operate between humans and non-human species? And that's all that's all in the essay there called Mutations of the Contact Zone, because it was completely uncanny to me that this this concept would take off, have a second life or a 24th life, however many lives it's had. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much for answering my questions. I now want to open it up to people here in person, and then we'll um, alternate between taking questions from person online. Um, is it okay with you, Mary Louise, if you take a couple questions at a time? Um, yes, sure. Okay, well, maybe we'll start with, because there's a lot of hands. So I'll start taking three in, in three questions uh, in person. It was Esteban, and then, um, Esteban, you want to go ahead and go first? No, no, go ahead, yeah. Give me, just one, sure to give me one second to grab a pen. Okay. Okay, Esteban, go for it. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, well, I have a two-part question. The first one is um, about uh, well, this notion of force and this, uh, this motion across contexts and levels. And in particular, uh, if you could say something more about um, the, po the possibilities of uh, coherence or contradiction or incoherence across contexts and levels on the basis of that notion. And the second part, uh, related to the, to the first part, uh, of course, uh, uh, is about, well, the, this uh, utopia of uh, 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 decolonized uh, reality, okay? And so, and it, I'm, I'm just wondering, is the, Okay, instead of thinking that uh, that those uh, what you called next steps should be steps towards an alternative to a, 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 a decolonized uh, reality or society or or whatever, um, uh, what if if uh, what do you think of, of of thinking of those? Yeah, uh, like. Um, 
uh, those, those steps or actions in, in terms of uh, really um, um, like processes that uh, contradict and seek to, um, uh, yeah, be incoherent or, or seek to, to make uh, a deco, uh, sorry, uh, to make a, uh, a colonized, uh, I mean, um, um, this um, colonization and 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 the the, the coloniality forces uh, impossible. I, I mean, instead of seeking like alternatives to uh, a, 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 to colonization, just keep keep uh, uh, doing those actions and. Not, not, not just um, try to to see if there is an alternative, an option to uh, colonization, but rather make it impossible. Like the, the total opposition of this enabling en enabling uh, force that you also mentioned. Like make it this like disable uh, uh, colonization instead of uh, uh, looking at uh, like just a few steps towards uh, uh, perhaps uh, more um stable and organized alternative mm -hmm. thank you again um well first of all about incoherent your the oh, oh, wait, wait, is it okay if we take about yeah your yeah, questions yeah. okay yeah. just because there's a lot of hands up okay go ahead david hi professor pratt thank you so much for sharing your work um this question is a little bit self-serving <laughs> But um, you mentioned in the introduction that you use um, Jose Rizal's novels um, in one of your chapters um, for thinking about the, you know, how colonialism, um, imperialism, and near colonialism sort of work hand in glove, right? Um, and the Philippines, and you know, my work is also um, thinking about Philippine American novels. I'm gonna actually use um, Rizal's novel in my introductory chapter, which I have not written yet. <laughs> and so um, I'm curious to, um, I think about his novels um, in terms of what Roberto Schwarz is, um, sort of um, describes as how colonial ideas get out, out of place in, in, in the target culture. Um, for, I, I use Rizal's novel as a starting point for thinking about the out of placement of these colonial ideas. And then I track that into um, the coming of the Americans, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I would just like to um, hear a preview and I look forward to reading the chapter um, to how you think, how you uh, discuss um, Mr. Rizal's work um, in, in that chapter um, in terms of the kind of larger question of uh, coloniality. Thank you. Okay. And we'll take one more question, Nico. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, so the question I have is um, a little quite practical. So thinking about um, your writing in the introduction about the rejection of hybridity, um, and I'm sort of interested in thinking about its implications for sort of non-Indigenous or even what we might call like Western theorization, right? Like the sort of white proletariat in Europe or the United States, right? The sort of non-Indigenous um, class, right? Um, and really, really uh, effectively, that mestizaje has not been sort of liberatory for indigenous actors by any means. Um, and at the same time, I think there's a sense that um, hybridity and am I correct? Okay, um, that hybridity and mestizaje has also been sort of inhibitory um, for those sort of working class struggles outside of indigenous communities, right? Um, so sort of working in the American left, one thing I hear a lot is like, oh, if only we could replicate ex the structure, right? If only we could, um, you know, come to this idea of consensus or, you know, you could talk about political institutions, which, you know, strikes me um, as sort of a reproduction of that liberal multiculturalist logic, um, you know, that's, that's the sort of voyeurist logic. But at the same time, um, I think sort of is part of those logics of hybridity and teleology and even those ideas of mobility uh, you mentioned. So this is sort of a big question, but, um, Given uh, the claim in, in the introduction that, and I'll quote here, indigenous people see plainly that their futures depend on compelling non-indigenous people to change their ways of world making, and that many of those people are searching for guidance as to do as how to do so. Um, to what degree do you think we can sort of 
theorize this level of, so to speak, cross contamination, right? Um, perhaps thinking of the contact zone here. Um, I know we can't see the future, but in terms of sort of working through and developing methodologies, um, how do we avoid reproducing this post colonial notion of synthesis or mimicry or hybridity um, while also cons consciously engaging in sort of united front, which opposes global capitalism and sort of settler colonialism from both sort of cosmopolitical standpoints? Um, and sort of given on the focus of futurity as something unpredictable, um, perhaps this is a question that emphasizes the need for a cycle of aesthetic and political practice and subsequent theorization rather than just um, sort of theorization. So, uh, whatever your thoughts might be on that and how we might sort of navigate those market waters. Thank you very much. Okay. Alrighty, so we'll do those three. Um, I'll try and be be quick because it sounds like there are other people. Um, so Esteban, I I, I love the idea of for that that using the concept of force enables the discussion of, of incoherence and coherence. You don't have an expectation of coherence when you're thinking in force, so that the places where certain forces behave incoherently are available for reflection um, and or places where things look incoherent and they're not. So I, I do like the um, bringing to bear that the concept of incoherence or coherence um, into the same, fr the framework of, of concept of force as a concept. And um, uh, the idea of decolonizing as thwarting the colonial at every turn is that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, and you wouldn't know, you won't know what you you won't know what you end, you're going to end up with when I think when you do that. But I do think um, that's that idea of of thwarting or suppressing it or inter interrupting at every turn is when we were working on the the book on Trumpism and uh, and um, uh, Latinx identity or Latinx citizenship. One of our we reached a conclusion that. Um, with a, with in, with respect to white supremacy, that um, and I I read this now all the time. It will never be made to go away. It, it can be thwarted. It has to just be thwarted at every turn and suppressed at every turn and kind of forced back into its cage. And that may be one example of the kind of thing you're talking about. But I think um, I would love to hear that idea developed um, more. And um, David, in terms of Rizal, I'll tell you what I what I do with Rizal. I see, uh, and I'm basing a lot of my reading on Vince Raphael in particular. Um, but uh, I see Rizal as you, and I compare him with Marti, for example, as in the Philippines to Latin America as having two different models for decolonization. So what I suggest is that in the Philippines, the model for how to decolonize the Philippines is not to separate from Spain. It is to join Spain and become part of Spain and become closer to the, to the, the imperial metropole and be incorporated into it. And so um, the, the decolonization of the Philippines was a lot planned. The, the independentistas were, did a lot of their plotting in Spain. In fact, if you go to the Plaza Santana in Madrid, there's a plaque on the cafe where they met. <laughs> and um, so that idea of, of one way to decolonize is to merge into and become closer to the metropole. Um, and in, in uh, the Philippines, that meant in uh, among other things, giving Spanish to everybody because Spanish in the Philippines had not been spread to everyone. It was, it was, it was held in, in the power of elites and particularly church elites. So it was a different model for for colonization also in the Philippines. And whereas the Latin American model was independent. So this all this analysis kind of comes to a head because Rizal is killed when uh, as a subversive, when he is on his way to Spain because he's gonna join the Spanish army to go fight independence in Cuba where the independence struggle is being led by Jose Marti. And I imagined this, that if he hadn't been killed, I imagined Martí and Rizal meeting on the battlefield in Cuba with two different models of decolonization, but both in the service of exactly the same liberal values um, that they agreed on. So that's sort of a little bit of an outline of what I uh, say about 
which is sell in the Philippines. And uh, Nikon, um, I, you know, the person that I really have learned a lot from around this stuff about indigeneity and the whole question of, of can Marxist theory, what is the role Marxist theory can play in relation to indigenous struggles, which I think is a little bit where your question is coming from. And the book that, I, that I'm really guided a lot by is called Red Pedagogy by Sandy Grande. She's a Quechua American theorist and it actually comes out of critical pedagogical studies. Um, and she, uh, her, her, her claim or argument is that um, Marxism, its, its drama its, and struggle comes into, kicks in after colonial dispossession has already happened, indigenous dispossession has already happened. And therefore it cannot provide models for indigenous emancipation. And, um, she, but, but where she ends up with, and um, I can read it if you want me to, but probably there's not time, but where she ends up is with saying, what would happen if we re refounded Marxism on the concept of land rather than labor? What would that give us? And that's, to me, it was a very interesting question. She doesn't try to answer it, but that's a place you could, rather than, rather than just saying we can't, Marxism is of no use um, in indigenous struggles, which in its current form, it, it isn't. Um, but, but can it be, can you, you, can you make a place where the, it meets? Yes, she, she thinks she can. And it would be re adapting Martin Trent, adapting Marxism, changing, you know, reform, regrounding it. So that's as far as I get with that one. I wish I could read the passage, but get the book. <laughs> oh yeah. There's nobody online. Oh, so we'll right. take, oh wait, Robin, wait, we'll take, we'll take three more questions. Go ahead. Thank you so much. That was so great. And like a lot of reflections have been coming up. Um, my question is coming also pretty self-serving. Um, it's just around like the way the use of words decolonization and decolonial. So um, I'm curious about, again, the use of words decolonial and decolonization because a lot of indigenous scholarship on Turtle Island or what is known as North America um, has been situated around decolonization. So people like Leanne Batisamosake Simpson or uh, Glenn Colfard um, have been using those like decolonization predominantly. And so I also I'm trying to use the words like decolonization and decolonial within my own research on Palestine. So I'm wondering, um, I guess, when is when does it make sense to use the word decolonial versus decolonization? And I guess when does it not make sense to use these kinds of terms um, on in different contexts as well, right? Because I was also thinking about the word anti-colonial and a lot of the critiques that have come up has been like the fact that anti-colonial doesn't necessarily offer um, alternatives, whereas decolonial does. So yeah, just the use of words and um, how to use them in different contexts and things like that. Yeah. Well, I was oh, saying, oh, do you mind? You, my name just said, we'll, take, <laughs> we'll go and take two more questions if that's okay. What was, your, um, what was the name? What was the person's oh, name just asked? Oh. Sorry. Oh, Rowan. Okay. And then David, did you have a question? actually pretty similar <laughs> really? but i was really kind of now you just clicked a switch in my head about the land thing because glenn Coulthard talks a lot about centering land and glenn Coulthard, the denny scholar glenn Coulthard, the scholar centers land in his marxism i mean just call centers land in his marxism um i've been really thinking a little bit about really using decolonization as a transitive verb like decolonizing institution decolonizing this decolonizing that and more as a noun because um, it was brought to my attention that decolonizing is really kind of upturning the entire globality of white supremacy, right? Because the function of racial capitalism can only happen because of theft, theft of indigenous land, theft of black labor, and so on, and permanent accumulation that's kind of been reconfigured. So in a similar way, you can answer the question akin to what Rowan just asked them. Um, what are your thoughts on using decolonization as a, as a noun rather than a transitive verb? Because my university that has been using the word in their EDI statements, equity, diversity, inclusion, and now decolonization. And I was a little stunned by that because I thought, I don't know how you can decolonize an institution that's nested in global circuits of capital, knowledge capital, financial capital, 
um, like really deeply, right? And uh, our university is personally invested in extraction projects in Latin America, um, as well as fossil fuel projects in Latin America. So that that's also an interesting kind of proof in the pudding uh, example. So yeah, just your thoughts on maybe uh, elucidating these um, these thoughts on how we can talk about decolonization uh, and the path towards that as a noun rather than as a transitory um, institution, institutional use, right? If that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. And then we'll take a third question from Marcella. Hello, hello, Professor Pratt. Um, thank you so much for the for the reading and for your your uh, remarks. Right now, I found them uh, really thought provoking, and I have a sort of like a general question and maybe two clarifying, more specific questions. Um, the, the the one of the parts that I found most fascinating about what you propose in your in your introduction is the work that you do around. Um, concepts, right? Concepts as this, as this mobilizing um, elements in, in, the, in, the, in the proposal, the general proposal of the book. And you uh, refer to Elizabeth Gross uh, to say, um, and to agree that, right, like that we use concepts to, um, to think our way in, in, uh, in a world of forces that we don't, do not control, right? And also in other part, you say, or quote, um, Gross is saying, um, concepts are completely worldly, right? They are anchored in real events, experiences, and materialities. And in this sense, they are not abstract. And so my question, um, if uh, it's it, my general question is, if you could uh, talk a little bit more about the, the materiality, the materiality of the, of the concepts, um, and you know their, their their connection to the materiality. Like you also mentioned juxtaposition as part of your methodology at the beginning, and that made me think of this quote that I really like uh, from Benjamin Walter Benjamin. He says, um, "Things are to ideas what stars are to constellations." Right. Also alluding to the obviously to his uh, methodology of um, thinking in constellations, right? And like in this kind of also juxtapositional um, way. So going off from that, and maybe now getting a little bit more um, specific with my questions, what uh, what would you say is the use of imagining being otherwise, or you know, like what you the the work that you attribute to concepts? What is the use of doing that, of imagining uh, being otherwise in isolation. Uh, so in the same sense, is there any necessary collective work included in your proposal around, right, like the, the, the concepts? Uh, in yet other words, are concepts capable of bringing people together around a project to change things around them in order to actually be otherwise and not just have an image of their possibly being otherwise, right? But I'm thinking about, of course, um, collective action, right? And organization. Um, and uh, finally about force, but sort of like going in the same direction. Um, what if any uh, is the relation that you attribute um, uh, between or attribute to force in relation to uh, power? Uh, do you see any antagonism, like class antagonism, behind force ever? And would you consider that maybe like that addition of right, like class antagonism to orient forces, right, um, as a as a as a useful tool to not only predict the future but also to intervene in the future, right? To sort of like clarify. And I agree, like we're standing at a moment where a lot of things in the future uh, seem really unraspable and, and, and sort of unpredictable. But I think um, being a, a Marxist and a materialist, I think that a lot of them are also very predictable, right? Like, and I think that the class antagonism, for instance, is one thing that hasn't gone away. And um, 
the pivot and the millennium has reconfigured that that antagonism, but at, at the basis, it really hasn't gone away. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you think that there's any use of um, these additions, like right, like collectivity around con concepts to mobilize action, praxis, um, and right, like force. Um, is it useful also to think about antagonisms in 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 that field of forces? Thank you. Okay, I'll start with that one. Yes, of course, force is all, is all the, all, often about antagonism, and it, it's the idea. It, there's nothing about the idea of force that is not compatible with antagonism. And cl class is another example of something that I you can read it as a structure and as a system, of course, and but you can also read it as a force, as something that makes things happen at all in all kinds of scales and and registers. Um, and I think of class in in that way also that that and it, but there's nothing about that 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 to me and, and weakens the idea of class antagonism um, at all. I think antagonism is one of the things that forces pr produce, you know. And um, in terms of concepts and collectivity, yes, I have. Um, this is something that's very prominent in Gross, and I, I quote it several times in other parts of the book. Gross is saying the alternative futures do not just arrive because you think of, or you think they, they must be brought into being. And her whole her whole project um, is, is is she's a feminist philosopher. Her whole project is how do concepts enable you enable the the work of that bringing into being to happen and it it won't it won't think futures are just not don't just happen alternative futures have to alter, have to be brought into being and she's very emphatic and extremely eloquent about that and of course they're collective i mean a concept is is a collective op shared object it only operates in the world because it is shared among people and her idea is that for the concepts are in, enabling in exactly that way that if you believe if you're someone committed to radical change then concepts are your friend <laughs> and you you create the shared shared energies around them and 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 the it leads to the work of bringing into being the alternative futures even though the real thing you're looking for is beyond the horizon the known horizon but you, the work is there and has to be done. So she's very, very um, emphatic about that. And I'm sorry it didn't come across um, in, uh, in the reading. Um, so yeah, the relation of force to power, I, I, I think powers, you know, there are, again, there's nothing about force that is, is incompatible with the idea of power that erases the idea of power. Um, I don't think it's just I find that it 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 enables a, as like I was saying a more flexible <clears throat> idea of, of, of power that you can use to observe what's going around you. So um, I'm, I'm glad to get to clear that up. Uh, about um, uh, both with Rama and and David about decolonial. Like I said, I might be not the right person to ask about this because. I, I, I don't find the term decolonial very meaningful. Um, and I, David points out decolonization is a verb and a noun and decolonial is an adjective. It, it, it doesn't, it has to have a noun to, <laughs> to modify, right? And um, I think that when, that what I see decolonial, you, I mean, it would be helpful if you said what the work, what it's doing for you and when you use it. Um, I remember hearing Mignolo talking about the decolonial option, um, that it, a moment when you are choosing to view something in a decolonizing way, um, or, or where you're choosing to perceive co the coloniality of something, then that choice, that exercise in itself is the decolonial gesture. Um, but I would almost be, my, my question for you would be, what nouns do you use the term decolonial to modify, and that will probably tell you what the work is that it's doing for you. And I think decolonization, um, David, you wanted to use the noun, but not, not the verb. Um, 
So like, we're going to decolonize the Museum of Natural History or whatever. Um, I, I'm not sure why we, why one, one is, does, is more accurate than the other or more useful than the other. So I'm not just quite um, sure what you wanted to say about that. Um, yeah, so that's, I guess that's about as far as I can get with that. Okay, I know we have uh, two other questions. We had um, Deborah and then Eduardo. And then if there's anybody else, just let, you know, ask, oh, ask people and also if anybody online, if you have questions, just please use the uh, raise hand function and we'll be sure to get you. Okay, so we'll do David and Eduardo and then, um, oh, I can keep, and then Sarah, and then we'll take a question online. Um, hi, Mary Louise. Thank you so much for a great presentation. I was really struck when you said method, and then you outlined some interesting approaches. Um, and I know, of course, you're the author of Contact Zones, which really got me thinking about um, the role of ethnography and learning through immersion. And it took coming to Sciences Po in 2020 to teach students there how to do ethnography to study um, Middle Eastern culture in Paris. Um, and about a month in, they said, why are you making us use the, the colonialist method uh, to study? And they were very, very resistant to, to it. And my only approach was to, to help them learn through immersion, to not bring them knowledge of the Middle East from my perspective, but to teach them to be miners and collectors of knowledge through their own tools. And so my question to you is, um, as somebody who's been at this for a while, how have you managed to be part of the solution rather than the problem? Um, because you go, you interact, you learn, and then you narrate. And, you know, as Saeed and others want to say that if you're not indigenous, then you don't really have the right to narrate. And it's something that I struggle with in my own work as a Middle East specialist. You know, am I extracting and, uh, and a part of the problem or am I actually providing anything that's transformative? And right now I'm helping a Kuwaiti family whose father was killed in an Egypt air crash. And I'm helping to navigate the international insurance um, environment that wants to sort of dispossess this woman of her true entitlement. Um, and the problem is you can't quantify the loss of a male figure, a patriarch in Middle Eastern culture. And so I'm actually able to use some of my knowledge <laughs> to, to try to help a family, but it's like the first time that I've felt like I'm not extracting for my own purposes and I, I just would like to hear more about that in terms of your method for navigating uh, the problems of speaking for others. Well, I- you did, Oh, sorry, Mary Louise, just, we will take one oh, yeah, more question, right. if that's okay. Yeah, uh, sorry, I keep sorry. doing this, yeah. That's okay. Sarah, would you mind using uh, one of these microphones, speaking into one of these with your question? Oh yeah, careful. <laughs> They're all attacked. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for, um, for sharing your work in these comments. Um, in the introduction, you write that the separation between colonial, non-colonial, um, and neo-colonial forms of empire as being um, an artificial separation. And so I'm curious what your perspective is on the distinction between settler colonialism or settler coloniality and coloniality um, more simply. Um, is this separation helpful or is it kind of misleading in the same way? Um, does the ongoing material occupation of indigenous um, traditional homelands require us to make this distinction between settler colonialism and colonialism? Um, and then do you see any implications for this distinction uh, in, I guess, um, anti-capitalist or anti-imperialist praxis? Okay. And we can take, we'll take a, go ahead and take a third question from Constanza. Okay. Uh, hi, Mary. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the role of the notion of the Americas in your work. And in particular, uh, 
I would like to ask, how does this notion of the Americas allow for an account of the contemporary, um, stress on the contemporary imperial and unequal relations within America itself? Um, okay. Okay. Um, so let's see. Well, um, to take that question first, Constanza, I, <coughs> I'm not sure. Uh, there is, I'm not sure how how uh, how uh, how functional the America's concept remains. It certainly remains functional in the sense in the present, in the sense that so much, you know, um, so much of the uh, geopolitics and economics are are north south and on in and hemispheric in nature, and so you need the concept of the Americas to grasp to to capture that those dimensions. Um, of ex, you know extractive extraction being it, taking that migration. Um, now it's also true that that there's a far more planetary um, enterprises with, with in which the Americas are are part of. So globalization is a is a the globality of the, of economies now and is is obvious. Um, so I think um, yeah I think that you you. The, you just it's just a kind of utility you, you, useful thing to be able to continue to uh, not to see uh, i don't think the americas are in a, have an essence or anything but this this history that's hemispheric in nature continues to unfold and that's the place where i think um the concept of the americas comes in to capture those processes that are hemispheric um the question about settler, settler colonialism and other types of colonialism this is where I do think settler colonialism has a particularity um, that is that, and it produces a whole different afterlife um, in places like South Africa or or the Americas, and as opposed to purely extractive colonialism, um, and uh, and as opposed to other forms of empire, um, and so I, I almost when you when once. When, to me, the, the move would not be settler colonialism and colonialism, but settler colonialism and other forms of empire. That would be the class into which I would want to put um, settler colonialism. Uh, but you do have administrative colonialism, which is just there's a administration that's running things and that's organizing extraction. Um, and that so you you can I, you can imagine that being a model that would you would explore the way settler colonialism has been explored. Um, so that's that's the way I would think about that. But I don't. I've always feel like it's very important to hold on to the idea of empire. And now we have you know business empires. I mean the imperiality or the idea of imperiality is maybe what I'm more thinking of. And you just have now with tech companies this incredible imperiality. Um, that's not state-based, right? Um, but I think the imperialist is a category that I, at least my, I myself, don't want to let go of. Um, and it, it enables things that coloniality doesn't. And um, David's question, oh, 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 no, the question about, um, about the Middle East, oh, of the ethnographic question in, in uh, Paris. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, I mean, you, we are all, we all inhabit webs of complicity, right? I don't, I could, you can write, I could see, you, you know, you could, you, you're part of the problem and the solution, or, or you, you try to move towards solutions to problems that, that you feel you have something to work with. But um, the idea that there's a, a kind of in, in knowledge making, that there's a um, innocent space, a non-complicit space um, that you're permitted to have, you won't be permitted a non-complicit space. Um, so I, uh, I don't, I don't think that should be can be an aspiration. And you live this as an ethnographer all the time. The coloniality of ethnography is is manifest, right? It's constitutive. And the, there's a chapter in the book there called the ethnographer's arrival. That's a whole big, quite a lengthy study of coloniality and ethnography. 
um, and that is built into the thing, but it, that doesn't, it, it doesn't, so there's a, a project to, you can, it, 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 it assigns a responsibility to respond to that, to try to avoid that, to critique, to change the practices and so on, as your students are suggesting. Um, but to search for a place where you're just part of the solution and not part of the problem, I think is probably, um, uh, kind of an illusion and and so um, what did you do actually did you change the method or did what did you how did you respond to those students uh, I forged ahead uh, we had students from about six different continents uh, and I think that I was able to convince them that it was less imperialist for me to teach them to use a tool that they had really only dismissed as being colonialist um, and to to focus more on what you can learn through immersion and, and the power of observation and, and the power of small observations. Um, and so I I told them, look, you know, these these tools are embedded in a discourse and in a politics and in a power struggle. But if you throw them out, you lose something. Um, and the projects that they produced were, I felt incredibly transformative. Um, and so we ended up in a good space. Uh, the pandemic uh, made us have to do virtual ethnography, which was a whole nother lesson. Um, but but I think that. We don't want to be rendered to silence, and we also want to understand. And there's something about removing multiple interlocutors that seems to get us closer to empirical insights. And I think that um, we all are products of who we are, right? And all the experiences we've had, which shapes what we see. And I think that if we if we end conversations because so and so is this, or so and so is that. You lose so much. And so, when you said you were talking about sort of the effects of imperialism on environment in Latin America from a Latin American perspective, like you have something to contribute based on who you are, that maybe somebody who's never left Latin America doesn't understand. So, more power to you. More power to my students and. Let us all have different contact zones. <laughs> well, underneath all of this, some of this is what, what to do about the university. Um, what, what, and that, that just overwhelms me when I start to imagine what would the university, what, what would it have to look like? To, what would the university we want? Or would there be a university at all, you know? Um, and I think hooking us up to the, the, the question of the university and the institutions that institutional settings that are allowing us to do what we do in, in, here in, with, and in which we're doing them is, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be a big part of your conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> It has been a big part of our conversation, I think, so far here. Um, I think that's all of our questions that uh, we have. Mary Louise, do you have any final comments? Anything you'd like to add before wrapping up? Uh, no, I no, I don't. I think I've <laughs> said what I what I had to say. Um, okay. I, yeah, well, thank you. Thank well, you. thank thank you so much um, for being with us today. We can all give Mary Louise a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to everyone for all the wonderful questions. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>